it's J.P. Morgan Monday, but with last week's events at the U.S. Capitol and a pandemic that continues to rage around the globe, there are other pressing things to discuss. Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simon Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief. Steve Usden, Washington Editor. Virginia Lee, Associate Editor. The run-up to J.P. Morgan, the year's kickoff and biggest biopharma conference, we saw a flood of new companies launch last week. Virginia joins us to tell us the latest. First, we're going to turn to Steve in Washington, D.C. Steve, what's on your mind? Jeff, I, I visited Arlington Cemetery yesterday, and in some places, the gravestones run out of sight. Some have names on both sides, a husband on one side and wife and children on the other. 400,000 Americans are buried there. That's how many Americans will have died from COVID by the end of this month. I believe that most of those deaths could have been avoided if the U.S. had Im implemented a competent public health response to the pandemic threat. A another thing to think about, COVID killed more Americans yesterday and the day before and the day before than were murdered on 9-11. So what I think is needed, among other things, is a COVID commission, like the 9-11 commission, an inquiry into the failures, an effort to hold public officials accountable, and specific actionable recommendations for making sure that this doesn't happen again. And I think it should be launched soon while the horror is fresh in people's minds. Otherwise, it'll be just like with Zika and Ebola and MERS and swine flu. There'll be a lot of promises made in the heat of the moment, and then attention will drift. Other priorities will come up. And I also think that there's a direct line between the activities of government officials, starting with President Trump, the storming of the Capitol last week, and the disastrous response to COVID in the United States. And that line runs through an attack on truth and on science and putting loyalty to the president ahead of duty to the country. Simone, I know uh, you're working on a commentary that we're aiming to publish today. Your thoughts? We're all obviously very troubled by what happened last week. I think that Americans, I would actually say citizens in other countries should take heed as well, but Americans are going through a lot of soul searching. And I think scientists have a special, especially biomedical scientists, have a special responsibility here. And it relates to the direct line about truth that Steve just mentioned. For me, I see a direct line from climate change denial to diminishing COVID-19 dangers, to defying masks, to rejecting election results and blocking the peaceful transfer of power. In my opinion, the Trump presidency has been just an unceasing battering of the truth. We've got words like alternative facts. And frankly, leaders, including scientific leaders, have just laid very low not to rock the broat as Trump and his adherents have really questioned the validity of well-established scientific principles. I think that there really is an opportunity for scientists and leaders, in particular captains of industry, to really reintroduce into the public conversation an understanding of the difference between fact and fiction. It's definitely, once you have facts, we can have differences on how you act on them, what policies you create, and that's where political differences should lie. The fact that people don't believe COVID is a disease, the fact that they don't believe masks work is, for me, an extension or a continue, continues through to the fact that they don't believe election results. And we really have to restore the importance of truth and facts in the public conversation. And I think that our industry, as scientists who live and occupy this occupies our lives 24 seven, we should really be at the vanguard of reintroducing that and changing that conversation in, in the country. I agree with that, Simone. And I think that another element of it is the need to reintegrate public health and medical product development. The pandemic has really highlighted what happens when those things get divorced. And the most obvious example right now is the vaccine rollout, which is, at the moment anyway, is going disastrously slowly. And it's because we've put tremendous resources into creating vaccines. It's a scientific triumph. It's something that's never been achieved this quickly or 
and, and it exceeded everybody's expectations for, for safety and efficacy. But it means nothing if those vaccines don't get into people's arms. And that's the case in field after field that biomedicine is making these advances in cancer, in autoimmune diseases, in, in, in many different areas. And those advances aren't being coupled with advances, at least in the United States, of public health and access to health care, especially equitable access to health care. And that renders all of the advances that are being made, in, in some cases, meaningless, and it certainly diminishes their value in all cases. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that I did last week was I spoke to bioethicist Arthur Kaplan from NYU Lango, and I actually asked him what Israel was doing in terms of the vaccine rollout, because they've, I think, now vaccinated about 20% of the population with at least the first vaccine. What he said was that they have an integrated healthcare system, but I pointed out that the UK does as well. And he said that the difference is they had a coordinated government effort to manage this, and they made it a priority. I think it's clear that in the US it hasn't been a priority, but the truth to what you say, Steve, it does extend to other diseases. You have to create a priority out of understanding how you're going to, and you've put it in people's arms, but for the other products, how you're going to get these innovations delivered to people. Because if you don't have equal access, then what's the value of them? I think going back to the Israeli example, the thing that's important there is that they've taken this on in a, a, a wartime footing. They're using the military and they're mobilizing in the same way that Israel mobilizes for war to fight the pandemic, and the United States needs to do the same. So do countries around the world. As I said at the beginning, the, the number of Americans who have died from COVID is the same as, as the number of bodies that are buried in Arlington Cemetery, and we need to take this with that same kind of urgency, and it's not been happening. Steve, we're nine days away from a Biden administration what do they need to do to right the ship? It's not going to be flipping a switch. It's not going to be the first day that everything changes. There are specific policies that they're developing, I think, could improve the situation. I think they're going to take a much more aggressive stance on administering vaccines and ensuring the vaccines get into people's arms. There's going to be much more cohesive communications policy about public health issues. There's going to be an effort to bolster the, the competence and the resources and the confidence in CDC, FDA, and other public health institutions. Those things are going to take time, but it, it seems that this is going to be their top priority from day one. Steve, what is the fate of the most favored nation policy the Trump administration has been uh, toying with? So that's interesting. That's one of the things that uh, the Biden administration is going to have to make some decisions about. Three courts have issued injunctions barring the implementation of the most favored nation policy. That's an international reference pricing system for Medicare Part B drugs. And uh, on Friday, the Solicitor General that's the top legal official at the Department of Justice, informed the court that the Trump administration is not going to fight against those injunctions. That means the Biden administration is going to have a choice. They could either continue with a more normal rulemaking process, which could take months, or they could drop the whole thing and come up with different approaches. I think that the thing that's not going to happen is that the Biden administration is not going to just simply give up on drug pricing. My guess is that they're going to try to come up with different policies, but they're still going to address the topic. Steve, I have one more quick question, and I want to go over something that you said last week, but given the events of last week, uh, it may have even changed. Can the Biden administration walk and chew gum? So the point is, it's now got a whole bunch of new things on its plate regarding impeachment and various calls for legislation regarding how presidents can act. There's also a pandemic. Does it have time to attend to all of those issues that relate to drug companies, or are they going to be put on the back burner for a while? The conventional wisdom in Washington is that it isn't possible for the Biden administration to do anything on drug pricing while it's preoccupied with these other issues. My view is that's wrong. 
I think it's possible to do multiple things at the same time, especially things that don't require legislation. I think that whoever is going to be put in charge of CMS is going to have a remit from Biden to do something and to do something quickly that's seen to address drug pricing. Let's change gears here. It's JP Morgan week. And with that, we are seeing the usual flood of news to kick off Biopharma's new year. Already this morning, we've seen Lilly announce Alzheimer's data that has its shares way up. Bluebird is spinning out its oncology business into a separate public entity. And we've also seen Sanofi announced that it will acquire Kymab for an upfront payment of about $1.1 billion. That comes after Kymab published atopic dermatitis data for its first-in-class candidate targeting OX40L. The deal could grow in size by another $350 million in milestones. Along with all this news, a dozen or so new companies have launched since last Monday. And Virginia's here to tell us a bit about what's behind that. So just to set the stage, there's been no shortage of early stage venture funding in biotech. Last year alone, we saw nearly 300 companies raise about $7.2 billion in seed and series A rounds. In what's been a capital flush environment, there's been a rush of new companies launching and coming out of stealth. We're seeing that continue into 2021. I'll touch on the three that we profiled last week, all of which were started by serial entrepreneurs. Um, we had Iconavir, which is developing tumor selective oncolytic viruses, and Mark McCamish, who was president and CEO of 47 before it was acquired by Gilead last year, just came on board to lead that company. Their technology comes out of the Salk Institute, and it'll enable oncolytic virus therapies to be administered IV rather than injected directly into tumors. Another was Myeloid Therapeutics, who has Howard Hughes, Ronald Vale, and Columbia's Siddhartha Mukherjee among its founders, and that company is reprogramming pluripotent myeloid cells to target tumor cells. It's one of several strategies that we've seen emerge over the last few years to flip myeloid cells from an immunosuppressive phenotype to an immunostimulatory one. And a third company was Endeavor, which was co-founded by John Hood. He also founded Impact Biomedicines before Celgene bought it out in 2018. This company is a little different. They don't have a platform, but rather they're rounding up best-in-class programs to tackle pulmonary diseases. So they're starting with a molecule from Eli Lilly that they're developing for pulmonary fibrosis. Those are just three among several that have emerged just in the first week of the year. Very interesting, Virginia. Can we expect this trend to continue throughout the rest of the year? Yeah, so there's no sign this will change for early stage biotechs anytime soon. Last week, we saw at least two more VCs raise early stage funds. Venrock closed a $450 million fund, half of which will be going towards healthcare. And the Dutch VC Biogeneration Ventures just topped off a 140 million euro fund for early stage European therapeutics companies. And that comes on the back of others that have raised new and, in some cases, record funds in the last couple of years. And we've heard murmurings of multiple other VCs raising funds that could be announced. This week, we'll have a second podcast on Thursday when senior editor Lauren Martz and associate editor Stephen Hansen join us to discuss BioCentury's 2020 financial markets preview and our annual Bysider View story. Lauren wrote the Bysider story. It's available now on our website. And in that piece, she says the pandemic has only deepened the already heavily weighted oncology focus of many portfolios. And it's targeted oncology opportunities that are catching the eyes of Bysider's in 2021. So we'll hear from Stephen and Lauren on Thursday. And with that, we'll get to work editing this boatload of news that is flowing across our Slack channels and email inboxes. All of our podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Music for all of our podcasts is provided by Kendall Square Orchestra, which connects science and technology professionals 
and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. Thank you.